Good evening, Sherry. Hi, welcome from Jerusalem. <laughs> it's not the Eurovision, but I always wanted to say that. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. My, my name is uh, Shirley Gretz. I'm a tour guide and I'm a writer. And uh, last year I started to work on a new book, an historical novel based on the history of the German Protestant community in Jerusalem in the 19th century. I'm from Germany. Originally, I came to Israel with 19, but since then I'm living in Jerusalem. And uh, that's why this topic was very interesting for me. As a tour guide, I knew a little bit about the history of Konrad Schick, uh, a German Protestant who came to Jerusalem in the 19th century. But the more research I did, the more I can say that I'm totally in love with the Schick family, which is good because I'm writing about them every day, so I should like them. Um, Schick has invested a lot of years and a lot of power in Jerusalem, and, um, and I would like to tell you a little bit about his personal life and how he came to Jerusalem and what he did here. Since we only have 50 minutes and, you know, being a tour guide, I can talk six hours through without a break, but we only have 50 minutes, then I would only tell you a little bit from what he's done and um, especially about his first building projects because he had many, but we can't talk about all of them. And God willing, next year, when the Corona or COVID-19 is over, you are all welcome to come and visit me and Jerusalem and Chick. Uh, and uh, personally and uh, see all the sites. Another short note, um, I write in Hebrew and I read in German. So, and I speak to you today in English. So if from time to time a German word pops into my mind or into this lecture, I hope you excuse me and uh, you will bear with me. So just a minute. Now we have to share the screen. Uh, Shirley? כן. רק uh, לכבות את המחשב השני, כי זה עושה עד. So, um, so we have to go back to Jerusalem of the 19th century. Uh, Jerusalem in the 19th century is a very small place in the end of the world, I call it. In Germany, we say a small village at the end of the world. And uh, Jerusalem in that time is a part of the big Ottoman period. You can see here to the right, you have a map of the Ottoman period. You can see how big the Ottoman period is and the Ottoman Empire, excuse me, and Jerusalem is just down here somewhere, a little small village, a little small town. And um, in this picture, just a minute, I have to move this. Um, in this picture, you can see how small Jerusalem was. For those who don't know Jerusalem, this is the old city of today. The, the walls of the old city were built in the 16th century, and up until the, you can say, the end of the 19th century, all the houses in Jerusalem, all the buildings were inside of the wall. Okay, so today, for those who don't know Jerusalem, this is called the old city. And of course, Jerusalem today is much bigger with houses being built all over here. You can't really see uh, uh, those mountains anymore. They're all filled with houses. But in the 19th century, Jerusalem was a very small place. And this picture shows us a little bit about this, the, the houses in, in the wall. And uh, we look from the uh, Mount of Olives in to the old city in the direction of the west. So um, people lived only inside of the wall because it was, because it was very dangerous to, uh, to live outside of the wall. And even dangerous sometimes at day. If you had to come from Jaffa, that was the port, where the port was, where if pilgrims came, they came from uh, Jaffa, then they had to take a convoy to Jerusalem. And the only way to go to Jerusalem was either by donkey, horse, or camel. There weren't even carriages yet. However, you had to go inside. You had to go with a, with a convoy because it was very scary during the day. It was dangerous. So every night, the doors would close. The big um, gates of the city would close. And no one can come in, and no one can come out. So this is the city which Schick meets when he comes here for the first time. 
So let's hear a little bit about Sheikh. Well, before again of the city, one more thing about the city. So these are two pictures of Gustav Bauernfeind, a German who actually came to Palestine then and uh, Jerusalem and lived here. And he painted what he saw in the city. And you can see from this place that we are talking about an oriental city, an oriental city where, um, where you can find a lot of different things. We have in, a lot of different inhabitants. You have Muslims, you have Turks, you have Arabs, you have different kind of Christians, you have Jews, you have a mess of languages. Yeah, you have to know one of the things that we know from people who came to visit Jerusalem in the 19th century is that you have to know so many languages as also today, if you go today into the old city and stand an hour there, you can hear almost every language in the world. And so you have a mess of languages and religion and nations and of course tradition. And you can see that in one street you have beggars that can beggars or merchants that can sit on the street, maybe barefoot here. This man is walking barefoot. And on the other side, you have richer merchants that got, walk down the street. And in this picture, you have the wailing wall, uh, the Jews wailing, uh, uh, praying at the wailing wall, the Kotel. And it's a very uh, um, narrow place uh, for them in that time. And this is the atmosphere that Chick meets when he comes uh, at the middle of the um, middle of the 19th century in 1846. So let's talk a little bit about Schick, where he came from and what he brings with him. So Schick was born in 1822 in a small village in the name of Beetz in Württemberg, which is the south of Germany. You can see down here, this is a current picture of the town. And if I know Germany, <laughs> and I'm assuming, I'm assuming, um, this the city looks the same even after a hundred years. So I'm assuming if you would go to Beats today, you would almost have the same houses and the same city size, maybe a little bit bigger. It's a small, small place. Anyway, so Sheik was born there in a farmer's family. However, he was known to be a very sick child and a weakling. He couldn't participate in the farm work and was often left home alone. And uh, he writes in his diary, when the first, uh, with the first money I ever got, I bought paper, colors, a paintbrush, and a small compass, and I started to draw with them. So it turns out that he had golden hand. He, um, he was very good with drawing and with trying to build things, and that already developed as a small child, and his parents saw that. So with 14, when he finished his local school, he was sent to another place, which is called Kord Korntal which is also in the south of Germany. Here you can see a picture of the old building of the school in Korintal. It was mainly a school for boys. And what he was mainly taught there was craftsmanship. He was learned to be a carpenter, uh, to repair and build clocks and trained to be a blacksmith. He also learned, uh, interesting, he also learned Latin, something else, but he was very knowledgeable. And with all these traits, uh, he learned to use his hands and was very well in uh, craftsmanship. However, during the time in Korntal, he met with some missionaries. And that was the first time that the idea to become a missionary kind of popped into his mind. The missionaries talked about their travels and what they do, and he liked it. So after he finished school with the age of around 18, um, he decided he wanted to become a missionary. And in that time, the New York of missionaries, the place to be was Basel, which is in Switzerland. So he went to Basel and he wanted to be accepted to the big mission, Basel mis mission. That was a very big school. However, he was not accepted. Uh, to the school. Um, but they told him that just near this mission, there's another mission which is called St. Krishuna Pilgrim Mission, Pilgrimage Mission. And he was accepted there. And that's where he started to work and to learn and to teach, mainly to teach children. He, um, from his career, we can learn that he was a very uh, good teacher, uh, especially because he tried to make things very uh, visual for the kids, for his students. So um, he was there at the missionary and, um, and, um, just a minute. and after, um, after a few years, um, the head of the missionary, Spittler, decided that it's time to send him on his way. Now, the first place where he wanted to send him was actually America. And lucky for us Jerusalem people, 
and people all over the world, <laughs> Schick decided that America was not for him. He said, I'm not going to America. And uh, so uh, Spittler said, okay, would you like to go to Jerusalem? Um, and um, a friend of Spittler with the name of uh, Gobat, which will, lay, which will become Bishop Gobat in Jerusalem, just went, he was from the Bajla mission, just went to Jerusalem. So, um, so Schick said, yeah, Jerusalem sounds fine, sounds actually wonderful, because as a very religious Christian, he has always heard about Jerusalem and was excited about Jerusalem. So um, Spittler sends two people to Jerusalem, Konrad Schick and Palmer. And um, you can say that um, even, the, even their road was already an adventure. They're, they missed their ship and their money went out and a person who was supposed to give the money died on the way. And it was, a, it was one big adventure until after two months on the way, they finally reached the port of Jaffa. And um, in Jaffa, they had to wait for a convoy to go to Jerusalem. I told you, you couldn't just go up. So they had to wait for a convoy and Schick was given at the end, they find, they, they wait for the convoy and they start um, going with the convoy and Schick was given a horse, um, which would be a good thing to ride on a horse, much better than a, a donkey. However, Schick was very uncomfortable on the horse and he was always in the back. So all the way when he was riding to Jerusalem, he felt the dirt on his on his face, you know, from everyone who's riding in front of him. And he was always last on the line. And when he finally came to Jerusalem and he saw the walls from afar and he was so happy, he was so disappointed because what he met was a city that was very small. It was dirty. It was stinky. And he wrote in his um and his memories, he wrote that he saw um, uh, how the desert kisses the gray walls and he was very desperate. And uh, so he wasn't really happy about it. And even though in his mind, he had what Spittler said, Spittler said his intention is so that the poor people there, yeah, in Jerusalem can see with their eyes a living example of how true Christians live, pray and work how they treat their surroundings with love and seek to help them with advice and deeds. So these were the words that uh, that Chick had in his head while seeing what he met, he was very disappointed. However, he was there in Jerusalem. You can't really go back after a voyage like that. And he wants to enter the city. And uh, now comes a very interesting story, which, which I think, or at least in my book, it will be like that. <laughs> and I think also in his memories, is one of the first religious experience he had in Jerusalem. You have to understand that many religious people, when they come to Jerusalem, they have some kind of a religious experience. It doesn't really matter what religion you are. Something in the air makes you have a, an, an experience. And the first one he has the minute he enters the city. Now, on the right side, you see over here, on the right side, you see the Jaffa Gate. This is the inside of the Jaffa Gate. Uh, at around between six, uh, 1860 and 1870. So that's um, almost uh, 15 years after she came. But you can see that the houses are very old. Today it looks very different. And the mod here is much bigger than it's today for those who know Jerusalem. And, um, and it's not really a nice place. It, as I said also, it stank. You know, there was a terrible stinge in the air. And, um, and before... Um, before Schick left Basel, Spittler had told him another thing. He said, every brother in the mission needs a cylinder seal, a cylinder hat, which he will wear while visiting the natives. So the more I read about Spittler, Spittler, the head of the um, San Krishuna mis mission, had some fantasies about life. The, the fantasies he had and the reality were not always on the same page, and we will see that also later, but that's what he said, you know, in his mind, when Schick will come to Jerusalem, he will have to dress like a gentleman, he will have to dress like a missionary, and he will have to treat everyone else the same way, and one of the dress codes is a cylinder hat. So Schick, all the way from Basel, had a cylinder hat in a box, and uh, all the way with him, you know, on the boat and on the way to Jerusalem on the horse, he tied it to his horse, to the side of his horse. He tied it to this horse, uh, making sure uh, that he won't, um, that it won't fall. However, when the horse went into the gate, 
a donkey just came from the other side, a donkey that was filled with crates, passed the horse, and by doing that, he crushed the box with the precious hat. And when Sheik went off the horse and he saw the, the crushed box, he was devastated. I mean, all this way, two months on the way, and all the stink, and he was muddy, and he was dirty, and the last thing, the cherry on the top was that his precious hat did not exist anymore. It was crushed. And in that moment, I think he had some kind of religious uh, vision because after he realized that it may be a sign of God and he said, okay, and he, and he, and he said it, it's to teach him the pride of sin and to remind him it would be better for him to enter Jerusalem as a simple pilgrim, humble, and not as a master with a cylinder. That is what he wrote to his children uh, in his memory. So um, that is a story he told them. So you can see that even the entry to Jerusalem for Sheik was very important. And this is the city he, went, he lived in for 55 years. Now at the bottom here, you can see Sheik at later years. Of course he wore a hat because most of the gentlemen wore a hat, but mainly also because he was wandering around the city a lot and had to cover his head. So a nice uh, story about the hat. Now, so we have a young man of, he was around 24 when he came to Jerusalem. And, um, and the first thing they noticed is that there were around eight other German people in the city. Where in that time, we're talking about a city which has around uh, 6,000 uh, inhabitants and eight of them were German. So for the first night he slept with someone, he and Palmer. And the next day they rented a house in order to build up what Spittler told them should be the brother house. Now, what was the brother house? What was the uh, idea of the brother house? Was to make a kind of workshop in which there was supposed to be a good role model for others, especially uh, for, uh, for people around them. Um, and dealing with craftsmanship and also teaching children how to be a good Christian, how to do craftsmanship. Now, they, this is a picture that Schick uh, painted by himself, you can see. Um, and this is the house, probably that's what he says, the first house. And um, I found the house, it's near the, it's somewhere near the Damascus Gate. Uh, I'm, some things in Jerusalem you can't be a hundred percent sure, so I'm not a hundred percent sure. But this was, uh, I guess, this is. A, I was told that this was the house, and I went to see it and take a picture of it. And they started their life in in this house. However, the first two months, Chick became sick, and he became so sick that he thought about going back to San Clishuna. Just imagine how much we would suffer today, or not suffer, but how we would have missed out if he really went back. However, he stayed, and after two months, he got better, he got treated, um, even though it was a very cold winter, they were very cold, they were not used to the Jerusalem cold, and um, so he started the life in, in the brother house. However, there were a few problems with they had to deal with. The first problem was water. I don't know if you if you have ever been to Jerusalem, but in the summer it's very hot here and Jerusalem only has one nature spring and uh, water is a big problem in Jerusalem. So how do you have water? You have water cisterns in the yard and you collect the water during the winter and then during the year you can take it out with buckets. So that's what chicken Palmer had to do. However, the taste of the water was so bad if you remember where she came from, yeah, from Beetz, from South Germany, and from Basel, water was much tastier there, I guess, that it was a very big problem for them, and sometimes there was enough, not enough water. In the last days of the summer, sometimes the cistern wasn't full of water anymore, so uh, they had to buy water, they didn't have enough money, so water was a big issue and a big problem. The second thing was the food. With all due respect, we are talking about two young men without any help. They had to make their own foods and only for that, you know, they deserve a medal. They, uh, it was very hard for them, especially since in San Krishuna, there was a woman, you know, doing the household. So, and the food was, was very different. So they were spending a lot of time baking and uh, doing the food. Another problem, which was very hard on them, was uh, other Christians. They were in the city where they had Catholics and Greek Orthodox 
who looked at the Protestants with suspicious eyes because the Protestants were a new kind of Christian group in Jerusalem. They only came to Jerusalem in the, in the 30s, 1830 something. And, um, and they were a small group. Uh, in 1841, there was a new community, a joint effort from the Germans and the English, and they opened up a joint, these uh, uh, <coughs> a joint uh, place together. However, the Protestants were a small and new group. And um, so sometimes the um, Catholic and the Greek Orthodox priests uh, didn't really treat uh, them very nicely. So this was another problem. The, one of the bigger problems, or if, if that's not enough, another problem was, is that Spittler, as I told you, had a fantasy, okay? And, and in this fantasy, the money that he gave them was enough, but the money was not enough. They needed even, they didn't even have money to buy a heater for the winter. It was given to them as a present. So uh, money was a very big problem. So uh, Spittler wanted to be nice. So he sent them cuckoo's clocks, as you see here, he sent them cuckoo's clocks in order for them, especially for Sheikh, who knew how to build them and repair them and sell them. Now, um, if any one of you have been to Jerusalem or to Israel or to any other Orient place, you will know that time and uh, uh, is not really, and punctuality is not really our thing. You know, time is more of a fluid thing. So a cuckoo clock, who would buy a cuckoo clock? So it was seen as a curiosity and it was bought by some Arab, um, rich families more as a really as a as an interesting thing but not so much as a useful thing however um he uh, had a little bit money with it but he wrote in his diary i have to be careful otherwise i will turn into a cuckoo's clock myself so these were the first year of shape and um, i would call them the survival years the survival years because he was surviving coming into this new place into this orient city however, not living up to his potential. And he felt, I guess, the same way, because at one point he asks himself, is this the kind of life that I want to need, lead? I mean, he wants, he was very, uh, you know, he had golden hands and he had ideas and, and he, couldn't, he couldn't live them because he just, he was, um, he was only surviving. Um, so after four years, he decided to leave the brother house and lucky for him, there was another place who would take him with both arms. So a few years earlier, before he came, uh, the English mission had opened um, what, what they called a house of industry. That was a school for boys that taught them craftsmanship, different kind of crafts, carpenter and blacksmith and so on and so on. And uh, Schick was already known to have good hands and be uh, very qualified. So he asked them for a job and they immediately took him as a teacher. Now, where is the Protestant uh, quarter uh, located? Uh, for those of you who know Jerusalem and those of you who don't, the old city, this is a map of the old city, is basically today divided into four quarters. Uh, the Christian quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Jewish quarter, and the Armenian quarter. Now, there was no Protestant quarter. However, in the 19th century, all of the Protestant institutes were located in this area. This is just opposite, a little bit opposite of the Jaffa Gate, opposite the Tower of David, basically. It's opposite the Tower of David. And there you had many different kind of um, institutes which belonged mostly to the English and the German Protestants. So in this place was also the school and he started to work here. So finally, after four, four and a half years in Jerusalem and under really not very good conditions, he, uh, he got a job, he got a salary, he had a house, he had someone who cooked for him more or less, or he can uh, get the food in a better way, and he started to live. So the first thing he wanted to do, actually, I mean, he was still a young man, was to get married. Now, I'll talk about his wife a little later, but uh, I will just say that when he was with Spittler in the brother house, Spittler didn't allow them to get married. He didn't want his missionaries to get married. And, uh, and once he moved, uh, Schick moved to the English mission, to the uh, house of industry, there was no problem with him getting married. So he wanted to get married. The second thing was that finally he had extra time and he had the head to start to doing, to use his brain and to do his craftsmanships. And one of the things which he brought into the, um, brought as a new craftsmanship into the house of industry was uh, the carving of wood. 
the uh, carving of wood out of olive oil, olive wood and wood turning. And here you can see uh, a beautiful uh, piece of wood carving. You can see in Hebrew, it's written here, Yerushalayim. And this was so popular, this wood carving was so popular that it was sold in the store um, of, the, um, of the house of industry. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, um, pilgrims liked it and people who came to visit and they were sold all kinds of things. They also made furniture and the students in the house of industry uh, became really involved in this kind of uh, 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 craftsmanship. And uh, obviously um, he became a teacher in that school and later he also became the head of the school until he resigned. So he stayed there for the rest of his life. So even though his working life was with a British mission, with a British missionary, his community, um, he will be a pillar of the German Protestant uh, community. So uh, this is the Christian uh, quarter, the Protestant quarter. You can see here, this is the Christ church. This is the first church that was built in Jerusalem, a new church that was built since the Crusader period, the first Protestant period uh, church. And this church uh, is a beautiful church. And uh, you can see here on the lower part, that's how it looks today. Uh, when you come to Jerusalem, you have to go visit. It's very, very beautiful, uh, wonderful atmosphere. Uh, on the right side today, you won't see it from the street because all these places are with houses. So you have to go inside the court and only then you come to a courtyard, you can see it. But in that time, there were no houses here yet. You can see the camel. Um, and uh, here, probably somewhere here, around here where the, was the school. Um, here you can see another picture of school kids. It's a little later. The picture uh, is a little later. Of, uh, but this was the, um, all the, some of the things of the Protestant, um, Protestant quarter. Okay, so one of the things that Chick did once he had time, and now that he had time, was to build models. He, uh, but his models were very, very special and he used them in order to teach. Now we're talking about a time, you know, there's no computer, no Facebook, no 3 digital, no PowerPoint presentation, no Zoom. Oh, they had a good time, no Zoom. Um, but in order to teach them, you had to show them. And the first model he ever built was a model of a tabernacle, which he actually already built when he was still in St. Krishuna in Basel. Um, but he later built it again with his students in order to show them how it looked like. So when he taught him the Bible, they can understand. Another model which he built was the model of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now this model is an amazing model, first of all, because it comes to show an historical and religious and political problem, but also um, this model is very special because what he did is, what you see here is a model of the Holy Sepulchre. However, if you haven't been to the Holy Sepulchre, you will know that it's not colored. <laughs> the colors here are the work of Konrad Schick because in that time, in the 19th century, the Christian groups would fight uh, with each other over the church. Each one would say, this belongs to me, this belongs to me, and they would fight with each other. And behind them, of course, uh, they were backed by their nations. So um, what happened was uh, they signed an agreement which was called the status quo saying what, what room and which floor and which uh, whatever whom what belongs to whom. And they signed the contract and Konrad Schick built this model according to this uh, contract. So he colored the pieces differently so everyone can know uh, what belongs to whom. Now, this was a sensation in that time because the churches wanted it to show and to see. And not only that, not only that he colored it, you can take the model apart and look inside to the model, meaning that now we only see it from above, but basically you can pick parts up, look under it, see what color it is, see which room belongs to whom. And that's how um, this made, let's say, the arrangement between the, the church is much clearer. Uh, now, this model was such a sensation that it was bought by many churches and you had to do the same model again and again a few times. The second thing that really interests uh, Konrad Schick during his whole life 
was uh, the water system in Jerusalem. He also wrote one article, which was so good that even today, everyone, every researcher who comes to re research the water system in Jerusalem starts with the article of Konrad Chick, even 100 years old. So here we see the Holy Sepulchre, um, uh, the water system of the Holy Sepulchre. We don't see the upper part, but we see little, all those little um, dots here. You can see those are water cisterns. And he recorded um, where the water in the church is, where their water systems, and so on and so on. Now, interesting, this model <laughs> is actually a table. He took a table, turned it upside down, and then built the model inside of the table. This model today is in a small museum on the Mount of Olives. And again, when the corona is over, you're welcome to come and uh, see this model. Another model which, which he built was a model of Jerusalem in the second temple period. And what interested him here was the topography of the mountain. It is known that Konrad Schick, he was everywhere in Jerusalem. He knew every stone. He went, he found a rune, he went into the rune. He wanted to see what's under the earth, what's under the building. And that's how he got to learn uh, what's, uh, what's on the mountain. Another, um, excuse me. One of my most favorite uh, models of Schick is this one. Um, this model is a very special model, not only because of the model itself, but because uh, how it came to be. So in 1873, uh, excuse me, yeah, 1873, there was a world um, uh, exhibition in Vienna. And the Ottoman Empire wanted also to show how big it is and how great and the great things that they have. So they ordered two models that would represent Jerusalem. After all, Jerusalem is this is one of the major cities, even though it was small and unimportant politically, it was very important religiously. So one of the models was uh, shown Jerusalem in that time, it was made by Stefan Ilash, but the other model was made by Konrad Chick, and this is the model. The model is of the Temple Mount of the Harem El Sharif. But what is so important, what is so interesting is, that until that time, no European was allowed to go on the Temple Mount. And uh, even if they were allowed to go, they were not allowed to do any research. However, because the Ottomans were wanted uh, Schick to do uh, the model, they gave him special permission. And he was one of the first European people that went on the Temple Mount and started to do research there. He actually went into uh, the water cisterns and into and under the earth and he could do his research there and he later even wrote a book about it so a lot of the knowledge we have what is under the under the um under the temple mount comes from konrad schick uh, he was very respected by the ottomans he was even chosen by them to be uh, an official and to be the architect of the city so he had a lot of respect so he built this model for, uh, for the Vienna uh, exhibition. However, what's also interesting is that again, you can take the model apart. So for example, you can, this part, you can pick it up and then see what's under it. And it's beautiful done inside, it's painted, it's colorful, and you can see the bedrock, the bedrock. And, um, and you can do the same thing with the floor here. You can pick it up and see what's underneath. So his models were not only just models, they were there to teach and to show and uh, he was amazing in that uh, sense. Another model, which also in opera, this model is in a small museum next to the Christ Church. So it's also, it's a beautiful place to see. Another model, which is next to, it stands in the same room. This is the model of the Protestant quarter. You can see the church here, the Christ Church, and you can see the buildings today, they look different but uh, it shows, and then there is a car that explains, you have the English uh, missionary hospital in the back and the German um, missionary hospital in the back and all of these places, uh, some of them are, some of them you can still see, some of them uh, less. So these are the models and there are much more, there are many more models. These are only some that I showed you that I've seen with my own eyes. However, there are models all over the world. Some of them, we don't know they exist, some of them vanished but uh, some of them you can still see uh, in many places all over the world. So the next thing uh, that Konrad Schick did once, you know, he had a salary and had a good life was he was interested in architecture. 
Now, the interesting thing is, just a minute. The interesting thing is that one of the reasons I love uh, Konrad Schick very much is that he was an autodidact. He learned everything by himself. And even architecture, he learned from books and experience. And uh, he was even honored the Royal Building Councilor of Württemberg. Uh, by the Germans. And um, so he learned how to be an architect. Uh, on the Mount of Olives, there's a library and you can find his books there with all his notes, the books he learned from. It's very interesting. Anyway, so um, he learned architecture. And the first building he actually built in Jerusalem was not a whole building. It was a wing. It was a new wing for the German hospital of the Diakonis of Kaiserslautern. I will talk about that in a minute. So this is the first building that Konrad Schick ever built in Jerusalem. Uh, you can see uh, it's very, the other buildings look all similar. Uh, a beautiful balcony up there. From there, you were able to see the Holy Sepulchre and you can still see it. And uh, the Muristan, which later the place where uh, the Redeemer Church is built. And this was the first building Schick built in Jerusalem. The second one was a smaller one. Uh, it was a house for, it was an asylum for leprosy, for people who were sick with leprosy. Um, he will build another house for, <coughs> for leprosy, but this was the first one he built. Today it's inside of a, um, it belongs inside of a place. It belongs to the Americans and you can't really go in there, but I think it still exists. The third one is Talita Kumi. Uh, I will talk about it soon. And then he also um, um, he also um, he uh, just a minute. Um, he also planned a neighborhood for the ultra orthodox in 1874, Mer Sharim. Now, if you for those who have been to Jerusalem, if you will go to Mer Sharim, this is the ultra orthodox uh, uh, neighborhood today in Jerusalem. If you if you will go there and will tell him. You will ask them, do you know that historically your neighborhood has been built by a German Protestant missionary? They would think you were cuckoo. I don't think anyone knows it. But anyway, the first historical neighborhood of Mea Sharim was built by him. Uh, he built many more buildings. Um, some of them we know that he built. Some of them we suspect that he built. And some of them, even if he wasn't the one, the main architect, he helped. Because everyone knew Konrad Schick. You know, uh, in, when you, if you came to Jerusalem and you were interested in building, in research or, or anything, you knew who Konrad Chick was. You would go to him, he would help you, he would refer you. He was the go-to uh, man. Now, um, I will take you to my second favorite place in Jerusalem, or maybe it's the first favorite place right now. <laughs> Um, so this is actually the hospital of the German Diakonis. Now, my research for my book actually started here. It started with the women who came here in 1851, the, uh, the Diakonis sisters from Kaiserswert, and uh, they came here in order to open a school and a, a German school, a German hospital and uh, a hostel. And the first building they, it was all done is, is this building in the old city. This is a model uh, made out of uh, wood, uh, probably also by Schick, not 100% sure, but probably made by Schick in uh, 1851. And this is the house. You can see it's not a big house. There's a courtyard. The, this, this is the entry. The sign moved a little bit. This is the entry. And there's a courtyard in the middle and then the rooms around it and a small garden. So at the beginning, when the sisters came to this house, they had the hospital and they had the school and the hospice all in the same complex. Now you can imagine it's not, it's very crowded. So at one point, uh, uh, the sister that later was the, uh, the director um, of the hospital and the school, Charlotte Pils, she came in 1853. She asked Schick to make it bigger. Now I have to say that Charlotte Pils is another, um, a uh, major figure in my book, and she uh, may have been one of the best friends of Schick in that time, of Konrad Schick. Anyway, so she was only two years older than him, and they did a lot of projects together, a lot of projects together. Anyway, so Schick, so uh, Charlotte Pitts asked Schick to enhance, to, to, big, to, buy, uh, to build a new 
two hospital wing. And this is what they did. The sisters sacrificed their garden. They had a beautiful garden here for the new hospital wing. And this is the first hospital. So as I told you before, this was the first building that Konrad Schick built. This is the, um, the courtyard today. That's me. And the sister who runs everything, her name is uh, her name is St. John. Today it's not run by the Diaconis anymore. Today it belongs um, to someone else. And, um, and, uh, and this is the courtyard of today. Uh, these are the Diaconis sisters. You can see they have a certain kind of dress code. And the first or the second time I came into this courtyard, I told the sister that there was a story that in this place, in this house was the first water pump in Jerusalem. I said, I read it in the books that I read. I read books from that time in German, you know, people write how they came to, uh, uh, to Jerusalem in those years. And this was the house with the, the only pump and the first pump. So she says, you know what? I remember something in the cellar. There's something like that. And they have told me that. So the next time I came, she brought it out and I showed her where it's written that it's the first pump. So you may have seen, I have may touch the first water pump in Jerusalem. Of course, I don't know if it's 100% authentic, but it looks very old. Um, so this is the building. Um, you can see uh, this is the building today. There's no way to take a better picture because the street there is very narrow, not like here. It's wide. Today they build more buildings, so it's a very narrow street. And this part, you can see it just over here. Okay, so it's the same building. In time, they built a third floor. So with Schick, it only had two floors. And later, there was another uh, floor built to it. Um, okay, um, so uh, the second big building, huge building that Konrachik built was actually this building. It was called Talita Kumi. This is Charlotte Pitts, who I told you that she's one of my main characters. So she, uh, she was actually a pioneer. She was a pioneer woman. Uh, you can say that in every sense because she was one of the first Christians with the first Christians who bought space outside of the old city. I told you that everyone lived inside of the old city. It was very crowded. But in the 60s, people start to buy land outside of the city and start to build there. Now, it's very um, dangerous to be outside of the city. However, she built, she bought a plot there and she asked Konrad Schick to build her a small summer house because in Europe, in the summer, you have a summer house. So she did the same thing she had in Jerusalem. And she would go there with her sisters, with the other Diakoni sisters and with the students. And here you can see they have a tents and a small, that was a small summer house, which they built. And obviously in the summer, in the summer months, when there was, there was, when it was so hot in the old city and no fresh air, that's where they slept and they slept in tents and outside. And of course they had guards to safeguard them. However, a few years later, she asked Schick to build a house and there, and this is the house that you can see that he built. This is another part of the house. And, um, and this was actually a girl's school for, uh, for Christian orphans. And a lot of women study there. And actually Talita Kumi, the school, was run until I think the 70s by the Diaconissim, and then it was 70s of the 20th century. And uh, the school still exists, not the building, but the school still exists in Beit Jala, and it's still a school where the kids have to learn German and, and so on. And uh, very sadly, in uh, 1980, the house was uh, demolished, was uh, taken, torn down. And the only part that was left was this part. This is what you see today. I took this picture a few weeks ago before when you were still allowed to go out of the house. And you can see this is the part they took down. So when you go there, this is the part you meet. Now, for Israelis that go or Jerusalem people, you know, when they walk by it, there's a bus station here. Okay, just here, there's a bus station. People wait here, they sit, they smoke, they talk. They don't know what it is. They don't know that it belonged to Konrad Schick. However, something else they knew. In the 80s and in the 90s, before we had WhatsApp and cell phone and Facebook and Instagram and all these things, people had to meet each other. And how did you meet each other? You called each other before and you said, let's meet at nine. And then you had to pick a place. And most of the Jerusalem people met at Talita Kumi. That's the name of the school. You see it still here in the sign. They did not know what it mean, but they said, you know, let's meet at Talita Kumi. And this was the, mo the, the place everyone met. I had a blind date there. <laughs> 
never turned out good. Married someone else, but you know, and there were blind dates there. And in the newspapers, you would find uh, clippings like, I met you at Talita Kumi. You wore a red dress you know, on Friday or whatever. Let's meet, you know? So it was a very popular meeting place for Jerusalem youngsters. And um, so everyone back then knew Talita Kumi, but not in the sense that it belonged to Konochik, but as a meeting point. Another building which Konochik built uh, later in his life was the second asylum for the leprosy. And it was a huge complex. It's not a house, it's a huge complex. You see it has a huge courtyard in the middle and rooms uh, all around it. And there um, and a lot of space around it, fresh air, good air. It was far away from the old city, uh, far away from any other place. And uh, the leopard could live there. And they would also do agriculture and take care of the house. Now, when I moved, to, no, later there was a wall around it. So today there's a wall around this house. So when I moved to, to Jerusalem in 1995, <clears throat> I was told, you know, and I lived not far from there and we would walk with friends and I was told that by then there was still a, a, some kind of a medical institution in the house, but I didn't really know what it was. And at that time I wasn't so interested in that history. I was really more interested in other things. And, um, and they told me that lepers used to live there and you're not allowed to breathe outside of the house because if you do, you may get leprosy. Obviously, total stupid thing to say. But nevertheless, every time I walked by that uh, house, by the wall of the house, I held my breath and uh, it took a few years to forget about it and to laugh about it. But a few years ago, um, the medical facility went out and, um, and a few years ago, the municipality decided to make it into a really nice going out place and like a hipster place. So today you can see how nicely it's lit in the night. They uh, there is a bar there, a really nice bar where all the youngsters come and, you know, smoke and drink. And there's a really good restaurant there where you can sit inside and outside in the garden. And in these uh, rooms, which used to be the rooms of the lepers, they have, um, uh, they have artists doing their artwork and they have small exhibitions there. And in this nice courtyard, they have uh, concerts. So sometimes before the corona or, you know, there were concerts there and it was really nice. So this is really still a part of Jerusalem. And again, I don't know how many people who go there actually know that it was built by Konrad Schick or the history of the house, but it's still a very nice place to go there. There is even a room and an exhibition there that shows the history uh, of the house. Um, so um, another small thing. So another house which he built was of course a house for himself. He built it in his sixties. Um, and it's outside of the city. It's on the Prophet Street. It's called Beit Tavor, like the mountain Tavor. It's from the Psalm. And uh, now I still owe you a story. I owe you a story of how he met his wife. Because besides being an architect and an archaeologist and someone who researches the whole of Jerusalem, really, there was no one more who knew about Jerusalem than Sheikh. And even though he was a missionary, he was, I guess he was a very um, gentle missionary because he was friends with everyone. He was friends with Jews, which usually didn't happen. Jews and missionaries were not so friendly with each other, but he was friends with Jews. And one of the, one of the, the people on his deathbed was, uh, held a eulogy, was a very religious man. And he was friends with Arabs and Muslims. I mean, he, he was loved and liked and, and really um, he was loved by everyone. So, um, he was also a family man. He had a family, he had children, which I didn't know before I started my research. And his children write that they loved Sunday afternoons at his house. They always had, after church, they always had like a food and they would sit together and talk. And it was a very special time. So um, how did he meet his wife after all? So I told you when he was a young man, after he left the brother house and he started to work with, for the British, for the house of industry, he wanted to get married. He had no idea how to find a wife, so he wrote to Spittler, you know, his boss, his previous boss. He was not, the previous boss was not mad at him. And, um, and he said, okay, I'm going to send you a wife. And that's what he did. However, Spittler remembered Schick maybe as a simple person, but Schick in that time had already involved, had learned a lot. And the woman, the woman that they sent was a very simple peasant girl, and Schick 
it, it didn't really, it wasn't a right fit, as you say. However, there was no way to do when a bride comes all the way and he went to pick her up in Jaffa, you know, there was no other way and um, he, they got, had to get married and they got married. However, she died after a year giving birth to their first child, to, their, to a daughter, which also died. So Shik was a widower, a young widower. And after a few months, he again decided that he needs to get married. It's a good thing to be married. And it was important. It was a value also, family values. But this time he decided he wants to look for his own wife. So what do they do? A lot of missionaries went back to their country in order to look for a wife. And that's what he did. He went back uh, to South Germany and he wrote to all his friends. He said, I need a wife, please give me addresses. So, you know, it was before Facebook, before Tinder and all these things that they have today. So he went with all this things with all the addresses and he went from one place to the other from one address to the other looking for the right wife and this one was married this one doesn't live there anymore this one he didn't like so he didn't find anyone so he went to his pastor and um they talked about how and da and chick told about the life in jerusalem the pastor said no what do you want what do you really want he said listen i'm looking for a wife maybe do you know someone he says you know what there is a woman in my congregation, a young woman, she's not married yet, she's very uh, strong-willed, and she wants to go to be a missionary in India. Maybe she will be willing to be your wife and come to Jerusalem instead of India. So he gave him the address, and she goes there and says, this is his last chance. He already had boat tickets to go back to Jerusalem, which he couldn't, you know, he could, couldn't miss the boat. And on the way he was walking, and this is like a Hollywood movie, on the way he was walking, and he suddenly sees this very tall woman and he looks at her and, you know, and something in his head starts rolling, you know, and, but he's not from there, you know, he doesn't live there anymore. He has no idea how to find out who she is. He can't just speak to her on, on the street. So he continues walking, but he turns around to look at the woman again. And she does the same thing. She turns and looks at him and, and he's hooked, but he has to check this address. So he goes to his address and he says, well, in his head, he's already thinking, how am I going to meet this woman? How will I find her? So he knocks on the door and there was a, a small child, a small girl and a woman. And they look at him, they don't know what he wants. And he says, I got the address from the pastor. I'm looking for a wife. I heard about your daughter. I would like to introduce myself. And, he, and, and the woman says, well, my daughter isn't here right now. You can come in and tell us a little bit more about yourself. So he goes into their living room, into their German living room. You know, they serve a little bit of tea and, uh, and some cake maybe. And they sit and they talk and uh, in his head, he talks, but in his head, he thinks about that woman that he saw on the street and how he can meet her. So, and then he hears the door open and in walks the woman from the street. So this is a really Hollywood story. Um, and um, they have to get married very fast because they have both, both um, boat tickets and they get married and he brings her to Jerusalem and they live a very happy uh, life together. Happy, but not easy because life in Jerusalem in the 19th century uh, was not easy and um, from his six children that he had with uh, Frederike Dobla, uh, only three girls survived. And one that is uh, one of the characters in my book, which interests me the most was Lydia. Is, uh, she was the first uh, girl. She was um, um, the first girl and she, um, this is Lydia. Here she's a little bit younger. Here she's older. You can see the resemblance to her father. You know, the nose and the mouth, you know, it's exactly the same mouth if you take away the beard. And here she sits with her husband, Adelbert, which was actually, uh, he was a doctor. And um, and uh, she actually, she is one of the, um, she and her daughter and her son are the only offsprings of Sheik that lived their life in Jerusalem. Um, she was also very talented and she uh, collected talisman, um, and she was very interested in the traditions of the Arabs. She wrote a book about it, also very interesting to read. And uh, here you can see her as a young family. That's her and that's her husband and the little girl. Um, and the little girl, Gertrude, here's the little girl again. And the last picture. So this is Lydia Schick, the daughter, and Walter and Gertrud. Gertrud got married to an American uh, who came to Israel, to Jerusalem, in the, in the 30s, 1930, and she left, and Lydia stayed by herself uh, in Jerusalem until she died in 1944, and Walter, the son, 
um, also stayed here until the rest of his life. Uh, in the um, he lived here until the 60s. And no other, as far as I know, no other uh, offsprings of Shit still live in Israel. I happen to uh, found a contact, his great grandchild, uh, who helps me a lot with my research and send me things and we communicate and it's really great to work with him. I'm very excited every time to talk to him and, um, and they will all be featured uh, in my book. So, um, so these are, this is a little bit of the research I did. Obviously there's much more, but there's only one can say in, in, in an hour. And these are my published books until now. I write historical uh, books, either as children's books or adult books. And God willing next year without Corona, without COVID, uh, in Jerusalem, the story of Konrad Schick um, in paper. So, so now I think, ma. Thank you very much. It was fascinating. Thank uh, you. <laughs> some people wrote some questions uh, during the lecture, but most of them uh, got an answer. Uh, there was a question uh, about Konrad Schick, if he was connected with the Templars. Do you have any idea? Um, so he was not connected in a family way. And the Templars and the Protestant communities were two different communities. And they didn't really have too much contact at the beginning. However, later, um, um, when the German, when the Protestant community and after the First World War and both of communities became smaller communities, they did some things together. Um, but Schick had some friends amongst the Templars, especially Theodor Zandel, um, and they did some things together. For example, Beit Hansen, um, the, one of the houses that I showed you was built by both of them together. So. Schick was a very open person, and that's why he had um, contacts to many, many, many more people than only his own community, even though he was very, he was a very big pillar in his community. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. I, I wanted to see how many people listened to you. And uh, I will... saw that there were 500 and something at the peak, I think. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I will open. I will allow you to open your uh, mics now if you uh, want to say anything to uh, Shirley. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank You're you. Welcome. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Great. It was really Thank you. interesting. Thank you. Really Thank you. Phenomenal. That was uh, Thank you. Is there some way to be in touch also later if we wish to be in contact with you, Shirley? Yes, you can all find me. I have a Facebook page, Shirley Gretz. Just look me up and it's very easy to find me. It's very interesting. Not like Madonna, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, are, are you related to the, 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 the famous Gretz history of the Jews? Are you related? Uh, well, I married into the Gretz family and I think he has some kind of far relations, but not me, my husband. Right. And and why did that beautiful building get torn down? The Taki the Sorry? Uh, uh, Talita was, Kumi. Talita Kumi. Well this was before um you know in the this was before there was so much um first of all it was very old and I guess it was easier to tear it down and to build new. This was before the very interesting. Reality had, um, you know, they were, uh, they were saving buildings. Today, I think today, if the situation would be today, they wouldn't tear it down. But it was in the 80s and the thought was different. So I guess. Uh, Thank you. Shirley, Thank the you Hansen is now a, uh, is a art center. And Salo has a graduate program there. I, sorry, I didn't hear. Um, I just mentioned about the Hansen building. That yeah. You it's okay. an art center, <laughs> and the Bitsalel has their uh, the graduate program in that center. It's used. Yeah, yeah. They have they have very nice uh, things there to show and, and art things and uh, and and a lot of uh, this. Is, I I wandered around there. What I do is. In order to find information, sometimes I just randomly walk into places, you know, and that's how I got a lot of contacts and saw, and I saw like rooms that are rented out to artists and they have uh, a lot of arty things there. 
Yeah, it, it's it's program. They run programs there. You, yeah, you yeah. Meet. And the government, and the city uh, sponsors things as well. Yeah. And yeah. You did a wonderful well, job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All the buses go. All the buses. Thank you. So see you in Jerusalem. Uh. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So thank you again, everyone. Um, as I said before, and uh, uh, we put on the chat the um, our website address. The lecture will be there uh, available uh, in a few uh, for you to hear in a few days, uh, as well as uh, all the other lectures that uh, uh, were taking place here in uh, our reading room. I will put uh, the link once again before we will uh, uh, close the chat. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a good uh, evening or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, we are hoping to see you again in our next uh, events. Thank you.